Welcome to One Haas, a podcast devoted to bringing the Haas community closer together through your stories. I'm your host, Sean Lee, and my mission is to help open our eyes to the network we never knew we had. My name is Sean Lee, and today I'm joined by Anna Simones of the EWMBA 2020 program. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sean. Thank you. It's great to be here. How's your day going in light of all this quarantine? <laughs> you know, life has been interesting so far, right? Lately, we spend a lot of time with family. I mm-hmm. am very fortunate to be quarantined with my three kids, three teenagers, my oh, husband, wow. who also works full time, just as myself, from home. And we also have with us right now a guest from Brazil, a wow. friend from high school who came to visit and got stuck here because all the flights are canceled, right? Then, you know, I've been cooking a lot more than I typically do, and I'm really enjoying that. Uh, We've definitely rearranged all sorts of things in the house already, right? Bookshelves and Mm -hmm. closets, and the kids are helping a lot. My kids are teenagers, so they're definitely in an age where they complain some, but they help a lot. Right. They participate. They understand. They contribute. So it's been it's been it's been interesting. Right. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing this whole situation resolve itself, of course. But I think I will also bring with me a lot of the learnings from this time in terms of family time and just learning how to connect with people in in these circumstances. Right. Yeah, that's 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 wonderful. I do have to build off of what you said about cooking because I'm going to use that as an opportunity to introduce you. Um, Mm -hmm. You are Brazilian, correct? Yes. Can you give us more of your background as to absolutely where you're from in Brazil and what you did before Haas? Absolutely, yes. So I'm from Brazil. I'm from São Paulo. And I I left Brazil when I was 19. So I Mm. did up to high school in Brazil. In fact, I started college and I am half German. I went to a German high school in Brazil. So I had a high school diploma for Germany and I was able to go to college in Germany. I see. So I transferred to Germany for college, uh, lived in Germany for five years for my undergrad and my master's Mm -hmm. and then came to the U.S. to actually came first to the U.S. to Stanford to work on my master's. Right. Left back to Germany and then came back to do to start my PhD, and that was 20 years ago. I've been here ever since. That's amazing. What What did you study um, all the way from you know your undergraduate studies to I, masters? I'm a linguistics major. So okay. when I started college, I I had this passion for language and communication and storytelling, and I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. Right. And I had studied a lot of languages and started doing linguistics. I actually started college in a very interesting situation because I, I mentioned I was going to high school in Brazil, but to a German high school. And the Brazilian high school only has 11 years, but the German curriculum has 13. So mm. after the 11th year of school, right, uh, grade 11, I had my high school diploma for Brazil, but I still had to do two more years of school to get my German diploma. And during these two years, I did high school in the morning and I actually started uh, college in Brazil. So for two years, I did college in the evenings and high school in the morning. And I did linguistics in college for fun. I was like, that's something I'm interested. I want to start studying. I was thinking I would transfer later for law or something like that. And I was like, it's easy. And it's just, it was easy because I liked it, right? And mm-hmm. stimulated me. And I, so I spent evenings just hanging out with college students and, you know, <laughs> kind of doing college stuff. It was amazing. And then I was still yeah. a high school student. And then I liked the, the discipline so much that I continued, right? And I managed to transfer to Germany to do linguistics as well. And then there I really got into more of the formal side of linguistics and math and, formalisms and into computer science. I actually did major in natural language processing. So I see the processing of language with computer science, right? And right. computers, 
which became a major area of AI, right? So yeah. started my PhD in the area of AI and cognitive science with focus in linguistics and uh, language understanding. Were you still, uh, did you do your PhD in Germany then as well? Or did you? No, do no, no. I came to, to Providence. I was a Brown for that. <laughs> that's that's just an amazing <laughs> journey. I, I have to ask, how many languages do you speak? I speak six languages. I used to understand and be able to communicate in seven, but six. So I speak Portuguese, German, English, Spanish, French, Italian. I did study wow. Japanese quite a bit, but I can't claim that I, I don't have it anymore. At some point, <laughs> I used to be able to communicate in Japanese as well. What did you envision yourself doing with this? you know, linguistic degree and, and all this wealth of language studies. I think early in my life, I, I was really passionate about teaching and I thought about having an academic career, just really studying languages and writing about it. And so that early in my life, that's what I did, what I thought I was doing. Right. And then when I added the computer science background to that, that opened up a whole other type of work and industry, right? Mm -hmm. And AI became and started growing and never stopped growing, right? So it was a field that became very prominent. When I started studying it, it wasn't, right? It was just kind of right. a quirky little space to be. But that was really, that was really fun to kind of see that field of study grow and open up a lot of new doors. But then when I, I actually never completed my PhD, right? I dropped out and went to do film. At some point, I I got pregnant, I got married, and I was like, I, you know, academic, the PhD made sense only for an academic career. And I decided at some point that was not really what I wanted to do anymore. And then I had my daughter and I decided I was going to stay home for a few years and always had passion for storytelling and film, got myself uh, an apprenticeship in Brazil with a film production company, learned how to do that, came back to the US and started my own business with video production and I always thought it was going to be a few years until I, you know, stay home with my kids. And I ended up having three kids. So I stayed home for 10 years. Right. And yeah, built yeah. my own business and ended up actually working with a film production company in San Jose, California, where I directed a few films, worked wow. at a TV channel, doing a lot of different B-roll and direction and production. So it was very, I loved media, I loved the fact that it was so, it's so transformative. It's so connected with people, right? It's all about yes. people, right? And mm -hmm. it's very technical too. So I really could bring a lot of my technical background, even in the algorithms that I had, like I had an accelerator at home to do my own compression for my own films and et cetera, right? So, <laughs> and so it, it kind of combined all sorts of things that were really exciting for me and ended up working in that field for 10 years. And, and then by almost by not by chance i always kind of kept that ai degree in my back pocket right thinking you know mm -hmm. maybe i i live in the bay area right this is like the epicenter where everything is happening in that space and i was like i need to try it out i need to get into it and see what it is i need to be a part of it right 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 and so then i got into a startup at first doing some linguistic work for them building uh, helping them build a grammar system for their languages mm -hmm. and that got me back into the field and really coding again and doing things again and and then basically from there i got a job at ebay doing machine translation which is what i had done in my graduate studies right gosh and and, and then where else did you go after that after after ebay after ebay mm -hmm. i got a job at intel um also doing uh, speech systems and language systems. We worked with a virtual agent. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a, at first was a research uh, scientist position. And then I, I kind of became very curious. Once I was at Intel, it was such a massive company. And I always really respected the impact that Intel specifically has had in the world, right? It's one of the few right, companies right. that really transformed, continue to transform the world, right? And I became really curious about understanding what that was all about. So I got myself a job at the very core business unit from Intel and started learning about how a company of that size creates transformation in the world. And that's where I actually 
became very curious about doing an MBA, right? At some point, I, I was very convinced about the power that technology has to transform the world and make transformation at scale uh, in a mm -hmm. way that is, it's very reachable for everybody. And I then that's when I decided I really needed to go do an MBA to kind of really open up my mind about how to make those changes happen at large scale mm -hmm. everywhere, right? Today, I'm chief of staff of the AI inference products group at Intel. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a product line for accelerators. So it's really, you know, cutting edge, top of line technology transforms every day, changes at a very crazy pace, right? Mm -hmm. Very exciting field to be. Absolutely. It's, and it's kind of like observing the change from like the cusp right where it's, it's yeah. really happening right there right it's it's very exciting to that point what are some of the most exciting developments that you see in ai and nlp well nlp has gone through a humongous transformation right i mean just five years ago it wasn't usable right you if you mm. talked to your phone you wouldn't do anything All right and <laughs> and machine Please repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's like and and machine translation specifically, which is the field I was working um and I have uh, specialized in was really bad. I mean, if you remember just three years ago, if you use any system to translate of any language that wasn't in, maybe English to Spanish, mm -hmm. it was just like it was painful, right? I mean it was it was helpful, yeah. but you knew you had to kind of go in and kind of fix a lot of things, right? And right. now, I mean, today, if you get some of the Western languages, it's mostly flawless. It's amazing, right? Yeah. Just yeah. the just the amount of uh, development that they went into there, like deep learning specifically, made a huge difference in the amount of data and the processing. Like a lot of factors conflated into making this possible. But today we have a machine, a, a machine understanding that is superior to what was just three, four years ago. And right now, I think what is really exciting is getting into the layer where you can then augment this type of understanding into a more complex understanding where you kind of really, right now, it's very narrow. The system can either understand speech or it can, trans there's a very, it's very, very task specific. and you were getting to the point where we're really learning how to combine the different capabilities and create a, a bigger a bigger knowledge to really start understanding, making, like reasoning, right? Really having a more abstract representation of the world where you can all of a sudden start reasoning and explaining things. It's, it's really a very exciting place to be right now. Can you give us an example of that shift? I'm trying to conceptualize it in my head. And, you know, every time I hear about or read about the advents of, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, sometimes it's hard for me to grasp because as humans, we have this consciousness, right? As they say, like computers have knowledge, have mm -hmm. just data, but they don't have this consciousness. And, and it sounds like that's I mean, is that kind of what you're getting at is yes. where they're able to go beyond just, you know, one plus one equals two and abstract other things? They're like, there's photos where you show a photo and a human sees something immediately, right? And mm. it's so complex and abstract. Like, for instance, there's a photo where there's a train stopped at a station, right? And mm -hmm. then there is... A soldier right hanging by the door kind of leaning out and a woman kissing him mm -hmm. right and then the question is is the train arriving or leaving mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like you know it's leaving because you know right. you know they're so passionately saying goodbye right but there's so right. much knowledge that goes into that understanding wow right okay. so it's really it's a very abstract it, and it's it's something that we as humans don't even notice that we do we take it for yeah. granted right right um right. and and really capturing that is is i think the next level of the next challenge for ai and really the, right. the next level of technologies are going to be addressing that okay 
Well, let's mm-hmm. transition a little bit into uh, your time at Haas. You know, uh, yes. just to give the listeners some context. You know, Anna is very involved at Haas. Anna, even though we're the same year, Anna was my GSI last <laughs> spring for the SIB <laughs> seminars, international business uh, mm-hmm. in Brazil. She led our group in Brazil and we had an amazing time. I have a video that I produced to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But, very, very nice video. But, you know, what are some ways that you took advantage of Haas that you can share with our listeners on how to really get the most out of the Haas experience, as I think you oh, have? Oh, my goodness. Yes. No, I, I definitely came to Haas to get the most out of the experience. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> that was one <laughs> of my goals. When the first day, like orientation, and then they asked, like, people are talking, oh, what did you want to do at Haas, right? Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, I want you to become a product manager. Oh, I want you, whatever, <laughs> right? Be going right. to investment banking and change the world. And I'm like, I just want to have fun, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I... I think a lot. Like I think for me, Haas became this this place where, first of all, for me, the most important part of my Haas experience was my cohort and just mm-hmm. the people I interact with, right? Because it is really in the day-to-day interactions, it's in the conversations, it's in that it's so stimulating. It's a lot of really smart people who are there to think about the world in a different way and make a difference. Right? right it's like a commitment you take when you come in and it shows and it leaves it lives and breathes in that community right. so it's it was for i live in the bay area right i live in palo alto it's about a two hour commute to Haas in a weekday and i am an evening student right so mm-hmm. there is a bus and i would leave work kind of rushing out every time right and kind of get myself to the bus and then i had almost an hour and a half to two hour bus ride where for me it was amazing because I would just leave everything behind, leave work, leave school, leave kids, leave family, leave problems, everything behind. By the time I got to Haas, I was immersed, yeah. right? And right. I and then spent like three and a half hours just really in class and interacting with people. And, you know, and I think these moments were just really just being that community was amazing right Mm -hmm. in terms of how really you know making the most out of it i remember telling a few students in the first year and the people still quote me for that right i would tell them like we need to really make sure we interact and we do things together because honestly the biggest asset we're going to get out of this experience is the people right it's just it's not just the interactions now that people are going to be in our lives for the rest of our lives, right? They're right. going to be there, you know, for the rest of our careers. And we all are going to go in different directions. And that's a great asset to have because now you have people that are everywhere and Absolutely. they really count on you and you can count on them. And that's a huge asset that you build just through that interaction that you mm-hmm. are there all the time, connecting with people, building things with people, right? I think the full-time yeah. students have that kind of built in, but we have to put the effort to do that. And I always would tell people, like, look, you, you don't have excuses. I have a full-time job and three kids. Yes. And so I, I became sort of an evangelist for that in the program of like, let's go <laughs> to that happy hour. Let's actually go hang out. Let's go take the time. And, you know, so I think for me, that was a huge thing and then just getting connected with the university itself i did i was the vp for diversity last year and i think just really contributing and giving back to the community is it it gives you perspective it gives you a further depth into your program Mm -hmm. and your experience right gsi was also Mm -hmm. really fascinating because it really gives you opportunity to meet people across many years and and also to interact with the professors in a different level, right? They all of a sudden right. they're talking to you equal to equal. And and that's really fascinating as well. So I did I think yes, I, I try to connect as much as I could. You know, the other piece of advice I'll give to anyone is take all those international classes. You know, I've <laughs> had I've had a blast. I've had so many interesting experiences, right? I went to France. I was in the ASAC program, the, that's a three-week program in Paris. 
Mm-hmm. And I can only say that was just amazing. It was vacation, right? It's like no kids, right. no husband, no work. <laughs> <laughs> Three weeks in Paris. <laughs> and we learned the, the quality of the program was really good. And the experience yeah. was phenomenal, right? Then I did the GS, IGSI for the SIB in Brazil. And that was, mm-hmm. for me personally, a very, very good experience. I uh, had... I left Brazil when I was 19. I never really worked in Brazil, right? Mm. So being able to go back to the industry in Brazil and understand how it works, how people actually interact and in that space, the professional mm-hmm. manner. I go back, I'm back to Brazil a lot, but I hang out with friends and family, right? right? In a very informal right. manner. So that was very pivotal to me and kind of <clears throat> really changed the way I want to move forward with my career, actually, in terms of really taking a much stronger focus with Brazil and Latin America and high, trying to really reach out to the ecosystem there. And so that was that was really interesting to me. And I also went to IBD. I went to Uganda. Mm-hmm. IBD is International Business Development, right? And you do a consulting project with a nonprofit. And right. we worked with We Care Solar, which is a nonprofit that installs solar panels for health clinics in mm, wow. rural areas, right, where they have no water, no energy. And that was just magical to be there and be a part of that, right? Wow. And I mean, just you are, you feel like you're transported into a whole different world, and and to be able to see and make a difference on that level was phenomenal. And you learn just the learning of the whole. It was a consulting project, right? It's really you have a deliverable, you have a client, you have like all of the realities of, you know, the client not able to communicate what you need to do or not being happy with what you delivered and tight deadlines and complications and disagreements. And it was, <laughs> you know, and you are in Uganda, right? Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden there is no power for 10 hours and you didn't know that the power was going to be there right Right, right. so so i think like as i said i think there is a lot of houses a lot to offer right and i think i feel i could be there for another five years and still be doing things that are new there's Mm -hmm. so much to explore it's really when you come in you know every moment think about how am i going to find the things that are most meaningful to me and really put yourself into that Right. That's that's really amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, I think we're really good friends because we feel the same way about how to you know <laughs> get the most value about building this network and really getting to know people, encouraging people to network with each other. Right. I have to ask you, with your wealth of experiences at Haas and your life as a whole, I- I'm really curious. You know, what are some things that Haas helped you discover for yourself? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Yes. So for me, as I said, I had an interesting career path, right? Because I started thinking I was going to go into academia. Then I went to a whole other direction, building my own business in film. And so I was an entrepreneur for 10 years, building my own business out there, you know, and I did a lot of I did every single aspect of business by myself. I was just a one man shop. So accounting and marketing (laughs) and all that stuff, right? It's like, it was interesting sitting through the accounting class and looking like, oh, I did that wrong. Oh, I did that wrong too, (laughs) right? That's so funny. Right? So that was interesting. But I, and and as I said, like after that, I kind of started really, you know, once I got into TAC, I, I really became... I got into the world of like big corporations, big companies, and kind of really almost enamored by the power that such companies have, right? I mean, the reach, right? right? If you think about the reach of somebody like Intel, like everybody who turns on a computer anywhere in the world is actually using a physical product that we made, right? Um, But once I got to, to SIB, I think for me, I rediscovered entrepreneurship. Right. And I really understood entrepreneurship, like looking at the companies that we met there, the startups and and just really talking to people in the communities and the ecosystem. I understood Mm -hmm. how transformational entrepreneurship actually is. And 
I was really glad to rediscover that right after the SIB class. I did take the entrepreneurship class and I've been really working toward building projects on my own. And I think I, I would probably in some future, hopefully soon, kind of really try to venture on my own into, a, you know, to something bigger. I know you've had a wonderful experience here, Haas, but I do have to wonder because I, you know, have been thinking about this lately as we're about to graduate. Is there anything that I would have done differently? And maybe there isn't. I mean, it sounds like you did everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I did everything. No, uh, we said something I would have done differently. I think I would have spent more time at Haas even. I think mm. I would have gone to more happy hours, more of the <laughs> Dean Speakership Series and like right. spend more time in the ecosystem, in the community, right? And right. Uh, I think I let, because my I, my life is structured in a way that my weekends are really not available, right? So I have mm -hmm. my kids, my family, where I want to spend time with. Uh, so right. a lot of the things that happen at Haas, uh, I couldn't participate on. And I, right. I don't know that I would have made it different because I also really value the time with my family, of course. But... If I had had right. the opportunity, if I didn't have the family, if I had more time in my hands, I would definitely have done that, right? Get more yes. engaged. I think that that I can't see anything that would come out of that that wasn't good, right? I right. think the people I saw most connected really got a lot out of it. Right. You and me both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have a quick round of just questions that we started okay. asking mm -hmm. um, just to, to lighten the, the mood. <laughs> what are you doing to keep yourself sane during this quarantine? Yoga, biking. I now have to go out at least once a day. So I take <laughs> a quick bike ride in between meetings, cooking and mm -hmm. board games and which board games is a new thing. Like I never yeah. had time for yeah. board games before. So that's amazing. Uh, so that's that's really as I said, that there was, you know, we kind of forced some time, some family time into my schedule, which is very welcome, actually. Right. A very welcome transformation. Yeah. Lastly, what is your best productivity hack? Uh, sleep. <laughs> you know, that's a good one sure that's a really good one sleep. i think the other thing is taking a little bit of time for myself like right my job can be very very hectic and very mm -hmm. stressful like i wake up and sometimes i'm in the office at seven in the morning right mm -hmm. so um i wake up always early enough to get about 45 minutes to an hour for myself i make myself some breakfast i read the paper Sometimes I will try to communicate with my mom or something. There's an hour that I take in the morning where I just do things for myself. And typically it's early enough that nobody else is awake. So right. that works. Apart from that, it's just, you know, good scheduling. Kind of really, you know, making sure you set time for things and mm -hmm. do the things at the time that you set them for, right? If you right. kind of stay on top of it, it it's just easiest, right? Otherwise, once it gets out of control, it, you never get it back. 100%. That on a good attitude. Just like, you know, at some point, you, I've gone through phases that was so much to do that I just realized it's not going to get done. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> what gets done, gets done. And what doesn't get done, it does get done. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. This has been a real pleasure, Anna. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for tuning in today. My aim is to bring the Haas community closer together through your stories. We're always looking for Haasies willing to share their stories and experiences so that we can give you more insights into the different programs, different careers, and ultimately different perspectives. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please feel free to email me for suggestions on how I can improve this podcast or if you have any recommendations on people or content you'd like to hear. My email is reachshawn at berkeley.edu. That's spelled R-E-A-C-H-S-E-A-N at berkeley.edu. 